The readings of Edgar Cayce provide some fascinating information about the relationship between Jesus and his cousin and spiritual forerunner, John, who became known as the Baptist. John, being several months older than Jesus, left for his training and education before his cousin. The Essenes left nothing to chance. With the young John in Egypt, his childhood nursemaid, Sofa, came to live near Jesus. For about a year before Jesus left on his own educational tour in distant lands, Sofa shared her experiences and insights of John's character so that Jesus would understand his cousin and be better able to coordinate their joint efforts in the years ahead. After John had completed his training and prepared the way for Jesus with his own ministry, the cousins were reunited publicly in a suitably choreographed setting at the River Jordan. In the Gospel of John, John the Baptist recognized his cousin from a distance and acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah, which is exactly what we would expect if they were not only cousins, but had also studied, trained, and been initiated together in Egypt. The baptism of Jesus by John in the River Jordan was the final public exercise in the preparation of Jesus for his ministry. Although they were both Essenes, there were very distinct differences in the style and content of their ministries. As Casey notes, John was more the Essene than Jesus. Jesus held rather to the spirit of the law and John to the letter of same. It would seem that John was more attuned to the Essene traditions as documented by historians such as Josephus and as revealed in the Dead Sea Scrolls. After all, the Jordan River flows into the Dead Sea. Perhaps John was more closely affiliated with the Qumran community of Essenes, who were distinctive even among the various groups within the broader Essene movement. The baptism by John was not simply a cleansing or purification ritual, which one might logically associate with the Qumran Essenes. It was an echo of the initiation that both had undergone in the pyramid in Egypt. As Casey noted, Jesus' baptism by John in the River Jordan was not standing in it and being poured or sprinkled upon. The complete submergence in the water symbolized the passing through death to a new life upon emergence. As he arose from the water, the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove descended and the voice from the heavens proclaimed the identity of Jesus. The Gospels inform us that after his baptism by John in the River Jordan, Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days of prayer, fasting, and temptation. Jesus passed each test and emerged from the wilderness ready to begin his ministry. When asked about the temptation of Jesus following his baptism by John, Casey noted that Jesus went into the wilderness to meet that which had been his undoing in the beginning. This will take a bit of explaining, so let's try to grasp exactly what Casey meant with the phrase, his undoing in the beginning. In Casey's cosmology, souls were created to be companions and co-creators with the source. As the Bible confirms, we are gods in the making, not the God, but gods in the making. It's a developmental process by which we learn to know ourselves to be ourselves, and yet remain one with God. We are to have a separate sense of self and yet remain connected to the source. The problem is that in the beginning, something went wrong. There was rebellion against the divine plan. Some souls rejected the proposed relationship and sought to make of themselves the God. The original rebellion occurred in spirit and only later manifest in the earth plane. This is where the concept of reincarnation comes into play. The Casey readings state that the first earthly manifestation of the soul that incarnated as Jesus was called Amelius on the sunken continent of Atlantis. As Amelius, the elder brother fell short and used the gift of the Creator, his will, in a selfish manner causing souls to become more entangled in flesh bodies, more separated from their divine source. 
As a correction to this error, from the realm of spirit, Amelius projected thought form bodies into the earth in several locations and inhabited one of these forms. This is the personality we know as Adam in the book of Genesis. As the story goes, Adam fell short of perfection as well. When he was asked when Jesus first became aware that he would be the savior of the world, Casey responded, when he fell in Eden. Or to put it another way, as in Adam all die, so in Christ all is made alive. Thus these trials in the wilderness were a personal challenge to the soul of Jesus to ensure that he could resist these temptations as he assumed the work of his ministry. The theme running through each of the temptations cited in the Gospels is that Jesus has to set aside his own will. He had to overcome selfishness. He had to let go of ego and assume his rightful position as co-creator with the source. This is the ultimate test for each person who follows the example of Jesus. I realize that this is a lot to digest, especially if you are unfamiliar with the Casey readings. I have created a video that addresses Edgar Casey's cosmology for those who wish to learn more about how souls became involved in earthly lives, in patterns of soul development that we call reincarnation. In the series of earthly incarnations, that is the personal history of each soul, each individual is tempted and tested, much as Jesus. We must each face our own inner demons of selfishness. In the Gospel of John, we are told that when Jesus was baptized by John, John affirmed that Jesus was the Messiah and instructed his disciples to follow Jesus. Two of John's disciples, Andrew and Philip, took his advice. Accounts in the other Gospels have Jesus recruiting Andrew and Philip and the others in Galilee with no mention of John the Baptist or previous encounters at the Jordan. The readings endorse the account in the Gospel of John and go further by indicating that when Jesus went into the wilderness after being baptized by John, Andrew remained close and kept in touch with his new master. Casey gave a reading for a man whom Casey identified as having a past life as Andrew, the disciple of Jesus. As Andrew, he was the second in a family of four. In early childhood, he was rather willful. When he grew up, he became a fisherman like his parents and older brother. When John the Baptist began his ministry, Andrew became a convert and then a disciple of John. Casey's account also states that when Andrew followed Jesus north to Capernaum on the northwest coast of the Sea of Galilee, it was he who recruited his brother Simon Peter to follow Jesus as well. The differences in the personalities of Andrew and Peter were notable. Casey gave a reading for a man who was identified as one of the 70 missionaries recruited and sent out by Jesus a little later in his ministry. This man, in the name of Elias, was a friend to both Peter and Andrew, although he leaned more toward the staid Andrew than the boisterous Peter. Casey said he argued with Peter and reasoned with Andrew. There is a tendency to think that most of Jesus' disciples were poor. Edgar Cayce says, not true. For example, the family of Zebedee were not strictly fishermen. Rather, they were in the fishing business as wholesalers. So when Jesus passed by and saw James and John with their father Zebedee, apparently mending nets, they were actually supervising and reasoning with employees who were doing the manual labor. Thus John and James, the sons of Zebedee, and Matthew, the publican, were rather well-to-do and closely associated with those in authority. Peter and Andrew were laborers that worked for Zebedee and his sons. Casey notes that even the family of Jesus, being kinsmen of the Zebedees, were not poor. Whereas most of the disciples recruited by Jesus were from the northern region of Galilee, Judas Iscariot was from the southern area of Judea. This geographical difference also signifies differences of opinion about how the Messiah will fulfill the prophecies. 
a theme that we will revisit in a later section. With regard to reincarnation, the Casey readings indicated that Jesus' disciples were part of a broader pattern. The woman who in a past life was Ruth, the sister of Jesus, was told that many of the disciples and associates from her Palestine life had reincarnated and could be known to her if she sought them out. Andrew, Bartholomew, and Jude, her former brother, were alive, she was told. John the Beloved was not yet reincarnated, but could be soon. Even Judas Iscariot was incarnated, although Casey recommended that she not seek him out. Thus, reincarnation is not random or haphazard. Souls tend to incarnate in groups in periods of history where they can work out their karma together. So it was with these souls who incarnated during the life and times of Jesus. They had been together before and returned later, many during the early 20th century where they received readings from Edgar Cayce. Soon after his baptism by John and the recruitment of disciples at Galilee, Jesus sought out his mother, who was in attendance at a wedding feast in Cana, a festival usually lasting several days. The bride, who was also named Mary, was a daughter of the cousin of Jesus' mother, an unnamed younger sister of Elizabeth. Casey observed that this was the other Mary, mentioned in some of the Gospels. These extended family trees and repetitious names can get complicated, to be sure. Thankfully, Casey does help us to keep them straight. Jesus' mother was asked to prepare the wedding feast, as was the custom in that period. Casey says that the feast consisted of roasted lamb prepared with herbs, the customary breads in the tradition of Moses, and of course, plenty of wine. The groom, in the name of Royal, was a son of Zebedee, being an elder brother of James and John. The day was June 3rd. Flowers were plentiful. The day had been fine. The evening was fair. The moon was full. The guests drank more and more wine. There was hilarity in dancing in circles, much as in modern times. Suddenly, the wine supply ran low. Keep in mind that the Zebedee family was of the upper class. To run out of wine on the third day of the feast would be a social disaster. Mary had been asked to organize the wedding because she had the means and experience to pull it off. Now there was trouble. Mary recalled that during the return trip from Egypt, there was an increase in food, even when they had been turned aside by others on their way back to Palestine. She was convinced within herself that there might again be such an experience since Jesus had matured and was ready to begin his ministry. Her request was almost a test, for she had heard the rumors of his temptation in the wilderness. Could her son do this for her? Would her son do this for her? These were questions in her mind. We are reminded of this in John's Gospel, where Jesus says to his mother, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. And yet, what obedient son can refuse a mother's request? The water was changed to wine. The wedding feast was a success. Jesus' first public miracle was a service to the one who brought him forth into the world. Casey notes that Jesus' trusted disciple, Andrew, was the one often given the greater physical work to carry out. So it was when the multitudes that had come to hear Jesus became weak with hunger. It was Andrew who was told to provide some food. The resourceful Andrew managed to procure the five loaves and two fishes from a friend of his son. Casey gave a reading for the lad who provided the loaves and fishes. He said that the lad was often too careful as to preparations. In this particular instance, it worked out well for everyone. For his role in this miracle, the boy was reminded of his thoughtfulness and generosity for the rest of his life. Jesus multiplied this meager amount into baskets of food to feed the multitude. The same process he had used on the return trip from Egypt. 
and changing water to wine at the wedding in Cana. With the popularity of books, movies, and TV documentaries in reaction to the publication of the Da Vinci Code, questions concerning the identity, character, and personal relationships of Mary Magdalene have exploded into our mass consciousness. The biblical accounts clearly identify her as a woman from whom Jesus cast out seven devils. Although over the centuries she has often been referred to as a prostitute, she was never called one in the New Testament. Edgar Cayce gave a reading for a woman whom he identified as the reincarnation of Mary Magdalene. His readings for this woman state that Mary Magdalene was a reformed prostitute who was the sister of Martha and Lazarus of Bethany. When Casey was asked to provide a physical description of Mary, he said that the depictions by Leonardo da Vinci, as well as by Blom, were representative. Five foot, four inches tall, 121 pounds, with blue eyes and hair almost red. Her features were derived from both her Grecian and Jewish ancestry. Casey also provides some insight into the nature of Mary's affirmities with regard to the evil spirits or devils that possessed her. As is typical in cases involving possession, Casey did not ascribe Mary's affliction to literal demonic possession. In some cases that he labeled possession, he described the problem as discarnate possession or discarnate influence, meaning that the individual was being controlled or influenced by discarnate entities, souls who were not incarnate in the earth plane. In certain instances, Casey stated that a person can be possessed by forces within themselves, patterns of desire and habit that leave the person out of control of their own life. These patterns are more of a spiritual or psychological form of possession, like an addiction. This latter form of possession appears to have been the problem as Casey identified the devils that had been cast out of Mary as avarice, hate, self-indulgence and related forms of selfishness, hopelessness and blasphemy. With regard to the prostitution question, Casey informs us that some of the confusion surrounding her activities is clouded by multiple instances of adultery recorded in the Gospels. In this instance, the confusion arises from the questionings of some of the various groups active at that time, especially the Pharisees and Sadducees who sought to entrap Jesus. In both cases, there was an attempt to trick him into violating the law of Moses, which prescribed death by stoning for women found guilty of adultery. The first incident involved Pharisees who brought Mary Magdalene before Jesus, insisting upon his judgment. According to Casey, she had set up a brothel for the purposes of sexual indulgences and also gathering information of various sorts from those in authority. Casey described her as a courtesan whose activities brought condemnation as well as pomp, power, and splendor. Her activity extended to Roman officials and important foreigners as well as influential people native to Palestine. Thus we have a bit of intrigue mixed into this account of sexual indiscretion. When Mary was brought forward, Jesus calmly stooped and wrote on the ground with his finger that which made the accusers recognize their own sin as each in turn looked over his shoulder as he wrote. This simple intervention not only foiled the Pharisees' trap, but converted Mary into a devoted follower of Jesus, who was subsequently reunited with her brother and sister. Mary became one of the holy women who supported the ministry of Jesus and the establishment of his church. The second incident involved a woman caught in adultery with Roman soldiers. In this instance, the confrontation was provoked by Sadducees seeking to ensnare Jesus. Apparently, they were unaware that Jesus had already avoided this type of trap when he humiliated the Pharisees. As in the earlier episode, Jesus wrote on the ground with his finger. This time it was Medi, Medici, or mercy and not sacrifice. Then he said, 
Let him that is without sin cast the first stone. This episode was yet another humiliation for the religious authorities, who would eventually get their wish. This elaboration involving the two adulterous women is another example of how Casey's interpretation of the Akashic records can help clarify issues raised in the gospel that are relevant to modern discussions on these topics. By the way, Casey was explicitly asked if Mary, the sister of Martha, was a sweetheart of Jesus. Casey replied, no. During his public ministry, Jesus is credited with performing numerous miraculous healings, many of which involved the forgiveness of sins. The healing of a blind man from birth, as documented in the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John, is exemplary in this regard. The questions raised by his disciples suggest an awareness of reincarnation and karma as factors in disease and healing. Interestingly, in this instance, Jesus replied that sin was not a factor in the man's blindness. In other words, there was no karma in a negative sense. Rather, the illness provided an opportunity that God might be glorified. Edgar Cayce encountered similar questions in the thousands of medical readings he gave for sick people. Sometimes he pointed out that the illness or injury was related to some past shortcoming or sin in this life or another. Sometimes he said that there was no sin or karma, that it was a purely physical condition. On certain occasions, such as a child being born with a severe deformity or mental retardation, he said that it was not necessarily the karma of the child, but rather a gift of the incarnating soul to the parents so that they might experience soul growth. Casey was asked explicitly about why Jesus so often forgave sins when he healed individuals. Casey replied that there are sins of commission and omission. Commission refers to sins that have already been committed and can only be forgiven. Sins of omission can usually be remedied by action, so they are called to mind so that the individual can do the right thing. Thus, like in the example of the man blind from birth, the relationship between sin and illness can be a complex, dynamic process. Nicodemus the Pharisee was one of the few members of the Jewish high court, the Sanhedrin, who was sympathetic to Jesus. The Gospel of John tells us that he first visited Jesus at night to learn of his teachings. Jesus told him that he must be born again if he wanted to see the kingdom of God. Later, Nicodemus advocated for Jesus when his fellow Pharisees sought to have Jesus arrested during the Feast of the Tabernacles. The third instance that calls attention to Nicodemus in John's Gospel is when he assisted Joseph of Arimathea in preparing the body of Jesus for burial after the crucifixion. Although Edgar Cayce did not give any readings for the individual who was Nicodemus in John's Gospel, he did discuss the teachings of Jesus that were so difficult for Nicodemus to grasp. Keep in mind that Nicodemus was a high Pharisee who would have been knowledgeable of Mosaic law and Jewish traditions. In rebuking Nicodemus, Jesus is calling attention to a failure to consider the admonition to be born again within the context of those laws and traditions. When asked about this incident, Casey says that Jesus, a scholar of the scriptures, is referring to the concept of spirit being born through flesh. As a parallel, Casey uses the example of Moses who lifted the rod and parted the waters so that the children of Israel could pass through. This was a transition from the bondage in Egypt to the new life on the other side. Being reborn in this context is the freeing of spirit from its bondage in the flesh body, yet remaining in the earth. Thus the soul can manifest the fruits of the spirit in soul growth while yet in a physical body, in a material world. Another difficult saying that Jesus gave to Nicodemus is that no man hath ascended up to heaven 
but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. The simple explanation here is that Jesus was in heaven before being born to Mary. With death, he will ascend back from whence he came. The deeper interpretation, which he wanted Nicodemus to grasp, is that every soul is descended from heaven or the realm of spirit. Each soul, including the soul of the questioning Nicodemus, will eventually make its descent back from which it came. This is a process that Casey referred to as the involution and evolution of the soul. Being reborn in spirit is a crucial step in the soul's evolution back to its source. In addition to these metaphysical explanations of Jesus' teachings expounded to Nicodemus, Edgar Cayce provided some fascinating supplemental details on the companion of Nicodemus, a woman named Martha. One of the first of Jesus' healings during his public ministry was that of Peter's mother-in-law. Cayce states that Peter's mother-in-law had a younger sister named Martha. Thus, this Martha, daughter of Sophia and close relative of the disciple Simon Peter, first became personally acquainted with Jesus. Martha was an Essene. As such, she had some awareness of the mission of John the Baptist and Jesus. She had been a childhood playmate of Judy, who would become the first woman leader of the Essenes at Mount Carmel. With the healing of her sister, Martha became totally committed to Jesus' teachings and joined the holy women who supported the ministry of Jesus and the founding of the early Christian church. This Martha, daughter of Sophia, stood at the right hand of the mother of Jesus during the crucifixion. Although somewhat shy, she was a beacon of kindness, gentleness, patience, persistence, and brotherly love the fruits of the Spirit, qualities that carried over into her 20th century incarnation in which she received readings from Edgar Cayce. Martha also had talents with regard to color and fabric. When she heard that Jesus and his cousin John were in Egypt taking their final initiations, she imagined how each should be dressed when they returned to Palestine to take up their prophesied positions of power. With the healing of Martha's sister from a terrible fever, both she and Nicodemus were greatly impressed. Martha began weaving a robe for Jesus. The garment was of one piece with a hole in the top for the head. The color was pearl gray. Nicodemus presented Martha's robe to Jesus after he raised from the dead the son of the widow at Nain. After Nicodemus met with Jesus at night, as described in John's Gospel, he had to re-evaluate his relationship with Martha. Until that time, Martha was more of a servant than a full marriage partner. The relationship shifted to one of equality in keeping more with Martha's Essene upbringing. However, Nicodemus never completely accepted the teachings of the Essenes, which Martha sought to exemplify in her daily activities. Of all of Jesus' miracles, the raising of the dead was the most dramatic and had the greatest impact on those around him. There was the raising from the dead of the ruler's daughter documented by Matthew. Then the resurrection of the young man at Nain as described in the Gospel of Luke. The death and resurrection of his dear friend Lazarus as told in John's Gospel brought tears to the eyes of Jesus. With each denial of death, the stakes were raised in a crescendo, culminating in the death and resurrection of Jesus himself. Coming near the end of his ministry, the raising of Lazarus was pivotal in several respects. First, there was the influence on those who were already close to the master. We have previously covered the impact of this miracle on Ruth, his sister, who was torn with doubt, and the conversion of her fiancé, the Roman Philois. As the word spread in ever-widening circles of influence, there was a mass effect with the conversion of multitudes of new followers to his teachings. With the turning of the masses in his favor, the growing resentment of some of the powerful Orthodox Jews who felt threatened or who were simply jealous of his success crossed a threshold of intolerance that soon would lead to the arrest, 
trial, and crucifixion of Jesus. Thus with the resurrection of Lazarus, the first of the rebellions arose. Like the healing of the man blind from birth, Jesus infers that the illness and death of Lazarus was for the glory of God. The Gospel of John states that Jesus intentionally delayed his arrival at Bethany until after the death of his dear friend. As a medical side note, Casey's readings indicate that Lazarus succumbed to typhoid. There were plenty of mourners, including those hired for the occasion, as was common in those days. The tomb was in the side of a mount. The sister warned that the body had been dead four days and that it had not been embalmed. Martha, the sister of Lazarus, kneeled close to the garments of Jesus with expectancy, awe, and fear as Jesus wept. Then the command to come forth. The resurrection was instantaneous. As Lazarus exited the tomb, he was not able to unbind himself from the burial wrappings and required assistance. Then there was a great celebration. The holy women that followed Jesus from place to place assisted in the preparation of a feast to honor the miracle. 